Welcome to To Know the Love of Christ. Welcome back. Last time we studied the feeding of the 4,000 in Decapolis. We saw the similarities and differences between this feeding and the feeding of the 5,000 from chapter 6. We saw the change of heart in the people of Decapolis. And we saw the Pharisees demand a sign from Jesus to confirm his messiahship, I guess you could say, since the last time they demanded a sign where they accused him of having powers from Satan. Jesus warned his disciples of following the doctrine of Pharisees and Sadducees, and he rebuked his disciples for not understanding. And then lastly, he healed a blind man privately like he healed the deaf man privately. And we discussed various reasons why this may have been done. So today we're going to study chapter 8, starting at verse 27 through chapter 9, verse 1. And Brittany's going to lead our discussion. You know, his apostles respond, you know, some people say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say one of the prophets. And then Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? I know what the other people are saying, but what do you all say? You're with me every day. You see what I'm doing. Who do you say that I am? And it was Peter that answered him, you are the Christ. Um, and then Jesus in verse 30, you know, he charges them not to tell that, tell anyone about that. But it was just interesting because you go back to verses 14 through 21 where he's having this exchange with the apostles and he's like you guys don't get it you don't understand it's like do you really know who I am they know who Jesus is but they don't know who Jesus is and so I just was curious what was some of y'all take on that or did y'all have anything on that it connects right into 31 right Mm -hmm. where I mean Jesus, I'd never, I don't know how I hadn't picked up on that before. He turned and saw his disciples after Peter said this. He sees, you know, Peter takes him aside from the disciples and starts to rebuke him, which I mean, I always use the word gall, the gall of Peter right Right. here. I mean, you're going to take Jesus aside, who you just confess to be the Christ and say, no, no, no. And I mean, we have um, other accounts of this, you know, and is it the phrasing far be it, Mm -hmm. far far be it from that Lord or something to that extent, Mm -hmm. you know, like basically, uh uh-uh, that's not happening. And I think almost, it's almost like, Jesus, don't you trust us? Do you really think we'd let this happen to you? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. But, I mean, they fell asleep in the garden. Spoiler alert, down the road. (laughs) I mean, I don't know that I would be trusting those people (laughs) to defend me. Um, But it's necessary. And I love that he points this out. Because really where my mind went, and I'm sorry, I'm having a total squirrel moment, but it all does tie together, I promise you. Um, Like I said, he walks them through it first, like, who do people say I am? Who do you say I am? All right, here's what's going to happen. When we water down Jesus, or we try to redefine him or define him as the world does, Jesus is saying, you're focusing not on God, but on man and the things of man. And when we do that, it's not fair to... One, to Jesus. It's not fair to the world, but it's not fair to ourselves either. Like, if we don't really know Jesus and who he is, no matter what we do, we're going to miss the point. And our compass is always going to be off. Mm -hmm. I like how he says, you know, who do men say that I am? Like, who does the world say I am? Like you've been saying. But then he brings their focus to him. Who do you say that I am? And um, in verse 21, 821, He says, how is it to you? How is it you do not understand? So they still don't understand, like you were saying. And he begins to, this is the first time he's explaining to them what's going to happen to him. Yes, you know, you professed I'm the Christ, you know, and I'm sure Peter was speaking on behalf of everyone at this point. That now, look, this is the gloomy side of what's about to happen. You're going to understand eventually, but this is, here's a, this is the beginning of it. It's going to get ugly. And, of course, you know, Peter, being Peter, because we're all Peter at some point. No, 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 no. Oh, and have that, you know, air knocking out of you blow from Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. You know, like you said, you and Rick joke about it. I joke about it. You know, 
You want some? Want a cookie? Oh, get behind me, Satan! Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> but to hear that from Jesus, it was like, oh, yeah. One thing I think about Peter too is, you know, Peter. We talk about the gall of Peter and how he went to Jesus, you know, the Savior of the world, and and rebukes him. But I also think for Peter, it was also coming from a very loving place. Oh, that oh, yeah, that yeah. friendship, you know, it's like, hey, what what are you talking about? Like this will never happen. I'm not gonna allow this to happen. I'm not gonna, you know. And that's partly because Jesus's time has not yet come, and so they still have a lot of learning to do. There's still a lot of teaching to be done. A lot of miracle, you know. There's just a lot. That still has to happen that has not happened yet before, you know, Jesus um, is getting ready to be turned over to the Pharisees and everything. But, you know, I just like to remember that, you know, Peter, from what we can see in Scripture, because we're always reading about Peter, Peter was the most blunt of the of the 12. It seems as if, you know, Peter was just going to speak his mind. And so but I also think this comes from a place that's like. You know, this is this is a loving thing. Like Jesus, we love you. We're not we're gonna we're not gonna let this happen. Like I, I hear what you're saying, man, but it ain't going down like that as long as I'm there. You know, and so and we know that it's when they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, like Stephanie said, spoiler alert: they fell asleep. But also another spoiler alert: you know, Peter pulls out his sword. He's ready to fight so much to the point that he cuts off Malchus's ear. Mm-hmm. You know, like he's not. I'm not gonna let this happen. And so it's not coming from a place of deception but at the same time it just reminds us too that sometimes what we think is good for us or what we think might be the best option is not and we don't you know Jesus says get behind me Satan Satan obviously has Peter thinking this is the right thing to do we can't allow Jesus to be turned over and we know that's what Satan wants he doesn't want Jesus to be crucified for the sins of the world because then Satan knows that he's he's lost you know, but it's like, hey, I know you think this is coming from a good place, but it's not. It, it, it's not like I this. I have to do this. This is the reason that I came to this earth. This is what I have to do, and I'm gonna fulfill my duty, and nobody can can stop me. You know, this sharp rebuke um, to me shows me that we are either for God or for Satan, because. Mm-hmm. Being mindful of things of men, which would be of self, are things contrary to God, therefore Satan. You know, I mean, Matthew 6, 24 and Colossians 3, 1 through 5 tell us, you know, set our minds on things above. So it's either, and we can't um, serve God or mammon. So mm-hmm. it's, it's one or the other. You got to take your, you take your choice. Yeah. yeah. And I was thinking about it, you know, because what you said Obviously, Jesus said this in love, and it made me think about Proverbs. I think it's 27, 6, where it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, mm-hmm. but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You know, I would much rather have Jesus tell me, get behind me, Satan, than be, you know, have Herod sucking up to me. Yeah. Uh, for sure. But, I mean, there, I don't know. This passage is just so chock full of just, like, nuances, and the language is so telling here. But I think... At this point, I mean, really the whole time, they are viewing Jesus as the Messianic king in Zechariah 9. And that's kind of how I think even the Pharisees, like all of the people, that's what they were thinking of. I don't know if they're thinking of that passage, but Jesus was prophesied to be this great king instead of Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, which is what he's telling him them here. Mm-hmm. Like that is what he's focusing on here. Like this is all the horrible thing. These are all the horrible things. I'm going to have to go through, and they just don't get it still. And we see that because, you know, Peter rebukes him. He rebuked Jesus. I know. Huh? And we talked about the gall. Um, but imagine, though, Jesus strictly warns them not to say anything. Imagine if they did at this point. Right. Their understanding is so incomplete. They would have caused so much like, confusion. And Jesus knew that. Yeah. And that's, what, mm-hmm. that's what I was thinking. Like, Jesus had foreknowledge right you know and just because you foreknow something doesn't mean you foreordain it and so knowing when to tell them like hold back because eventually i mean he comes riding in like zechariah 9 on a donkey and they throw the palm leaves down and all that and so that's prophecy but like if they'd done that too soon it would have thrown off all the events and so he knew where to guide them and i mean he god can work with anything providence of god i mean 
but he knew to reveal it too soon would be problematic. It makes me think about um, when Jesus' mother came to him at the wedding feast, and mm-hmm. he says, woman, it's not my time yet. You know, mm-hmm. he knew that there is a timeline that he had to go by, and maybe there is some wiggle room in there, but there are certain things they couldn't know. Like, I think we mentioned it either earlier this episode or last episode. Like, had they gotten it, they wouldn't have allowed it to happen. Mm-hmm. And so it had to happen in just the right order in order for us to have salvation. You know, otherwise we wouldn't. And that's what it says in Zechariah 9, uh, verse 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So, I mean, had had it happened in any other way, our salvation, I mean, God can work with anything, but it could have been jeopardized, potentially. And even if they went out preaching now, you know, that Jesus, and professing that Jesus is the king, the the all the things they would have to retract. Oh wait, uh, th- you know that's what I mean by all the confusion yeah. they would have preached I mean, and, and with stuff. Herod coming at him, mm-hmm. you know, being fearful of him. And I think about I don't know, just it's so amazing how God weaves things together. I know I've already mentioned that, but like Luke twenty two thirty one, Simon Simon, which is talking about Peter. Behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. I mean, had, like, you think about Peter, he's rebuking him here, and it seems like Jesus is always getting on to Peter. Like, (laughs) why'd you have such little faith? And then you think, you know, get behind me, Satan. You know, when he cut off Malchus's ear, he's like, "Uh uh-uh. Like, you can't do Mm -hmm. that. And then there, in that account, like, had Peter not gone through those things, would he have been there at Acts 2? Yeah, but I was just thinking about Verse 34, and calling a crowd to him with the, with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So first, you know, deny yourself. Don't do what you think is right. Do what, do, you know, mimic me. This is what I'm doing. You know, deny yourself. Peter, I know you think you're doing the right thing by saying that you're not going to let this happen, but you're actually trying to mess up a whole Plan, redemption plan here you're gonna mess it all up so you need to chill you know deny yourself mimic me do what i say but then also when you look at verse 35 he says for whoever would save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospels will save it clearly jesus is talking to the disciples in the crowd but i also just thought about you know what if You know, and I don't believe that obviously God wouldn't have let this happen because he had a whole plan. But like in in the process of Peter trying to save the life of Jesus, he was going to lose his own life, spiritually speaking. Mm -hmm. Like we all know that we're going to die. But if Peter is so gung ho about trying to save Jesus's life at the end of the at the end of the day, he's really going to mess it up for himself and for all the world because We're all going to lose our lives, spiritually speaking. But he says, but if you lose your life for me, if if you die for my sake, you will save your life. Yeah, And I just thought, you know, Jesus is, I have to die if you want to live. And I just thought that was, it was, to me, not necessarily a play on words, but kind of like a twofold thing, I guess. That's a small amount of word right there, but it's it's very powerful. Yeah. So I totally geeked out on that word deny because it can be used as disown. Oh, really? Yeah, that's that's one of the usages of that Greek word. So, I mean, it's to me deny and disown are like really. I mean, the nuances are different, but like that's what we're told to do. You know, like Galatians two twenty, you're crucified with Christ. It's no longer you who lives; it's Christ who lives in you. And so in order, you know, it talks about in Ephesians, I believe we went through that, the old man, we we can disown ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. And in disowning ourselves, he owns us. And we gain, we gain like, I love the, the wording there in 36, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in return for his soul? Because there is... No matter what you do, there is never a true prophet when you give up your soul for anything other than God. The only way to get a prophet on that 
is to give up your soul to God. And we have everything to gain with him. We only need to lose ourselves or disown mm-hmm. ourselves. Uh, after that, he says, oh, in verse 38, whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed uh, Ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And, I mean, that's... Mm, that's a that's a that's a sad sad thing to think about. Like Jesus is ashamed of me, you know. I mean, I just think about as a kid things that I did, and I'm sure I I brought some shame and you know really disappointed my mom. And when I did those things, like I you know in the moment I probably wasn't thinking that like I was being selfish. This is what I wanted to do. But when you know I would get spankings and stuff like that. But when my mom told me she was disappointed in me and she was ashamed of what I did, I mean, like I just, I cowered. Like it, it was, it was so hurtful. It's very hurtful to hear my parents say, "I'm disappointed in you and I'm ashamed of you." <laughs> Wait a minute, mm-hmm. I'm your child. You know, yeah. like what could I really do? But Jesus says, you know, if you ashamed of me, you don't want to hear what I have to say. You don't want to obeying my commands I will be ashamed of you when the time comes when it t- comes time for me to to recognize you in front of my father I won't you know and then you'll end up here and depart from me for I never knew you and that that's just a that's just a sad thought altogether to 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 think about and then in verse um, chapter 9 verse 1 and he said to them truly I say to you there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after ha- after it has come with with power um d what was your take on that or did you have anything on that well the kingdom of god we've we talked about before is the church right so he's like i say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of god present with power so there was some that were in the crowd that was listening that were going to see the beginning of his church I mean, mm-hmm. they, were, they weren't going to die until the, his church was established. So he's given them kind of the um, end cap of, look, it's going to get dark, gloomy. You choose right. me or the world. And if you choose me, you know, you're going to be a part of the, the kingdom, my kingdom, his kingdom. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have anything particularly on that verse I agree with what Dee said Um, I was more intrigued with verse 38 where he called them an adulterous and sinful generation Mm. and I you know I just wonder contextually what exactly that means Um, I did a little bit of research on it not a ton and I was just wondering I mean as far as like calling them an adulterous generation I would think that that would mean not like they're all committing adultery. Right. But I mean... Spiritually. Spiritual adultery yeah. against God. And for the, like, they called a crowd there. I wonder if any of the Pharisees were in that crowd. Because mm. for the Pharisees to have heard themselves be lumped into a generation that would be considered adulterous to God when they think that Jesus is a blasphemer or they're accusing him of it, whether or not they actually believe it. You know, I think they did. But I mean... That would be just as harsh to them as Jesus saying what he said to Peter. But considering all, like you said, contextually, he's talking with Peter, you know, well, his apostles, who do you say that I am? Right. You know, we just discussed the whole Pharisee thing. Who do you say I am? And then, you know, he gets the keys to the kingdom in, but then gets a sharp rebuke, choose, you know, it's either me or Satan. The kingdom's going to come. This is a, an adulterous, spiritually adulterous. You know, we talk about saving life to lose it. You know, the the Jews were so spiritually adulterous. Mm-hmm. Right? So, And they, they had yeah. just come out of Babylon before, you know. Mm-hmm. And so they were terrified of idol- idolatry. I think I've brought this up before. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's almost like they were worshiping the law instead of the lawmaker. Right. But I think about it. Jesus came in the fullness of time. Mm-hmm. And so I know I've heard people say before, like, can you imagine being able to live when Jesus lived and walk with Jesus and be able, but I mean, you would have been lumped into this generation because this was the perfect generation, the fullest 
possibility for Jesus to come and be crucified. Right. No matter how bad we think it, it is getting, we are not in the generation that crucified Jesus, that put him to death. I mean, by our sins, we've crucified him. Yeah, Stephanie, you were talking about the adulterous generation, and I thought about the uh, book of Ezekiel. You're worshiping these these other these idols and stuff. It's as if you're you're committing adultery against against God. You have that covenant um, with for, God. fornicating with other gods. You know, yeah, so to speak. So to speak yeah. Quote, you know, if that makes sense. I also like yeah. to think, you know, Hosea there as well, along with Ezekiel. Hosea is mm-hmm. a good. All right. Well, if nobody had anything else to add, that brings us to our our question: Where do you see the love of Christ? So, um, Stephanie, I see it in verse thirty-five, where it says, "For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, and the gospels will save it." I mean, I'm sure we've brought this up before, but if we haven't, the Christian life is honestly the best life you can live. Like, no matter which way you slice it. God knows so much more than we know in his abundant and infinite wisdom and the fact that he provided a way for us to live the best life even because we're going to suffer no matter what. Um, In this life, there will be hardships and pain and toiling, um, but we have a chance to improve our circumstances by being a child of God and a follower of Jesus, and he provides that for us, and it's kind of backwards thinking to the world. But we know it's not backwards. It's the right way. And, you know, by taking, you know, by disowning ourselves and taking up our cross and following him, we have the opportunity to do that. And that's where I see it, that he provided that opportunity. Very good. Dee? Um, I see it in verse 30 when he told him not to say anything after Peter confessed him as Christ. Um because in verse 31, he said, and he began to teach them. Of course, he was teaching them about the dark side of what's about to happen to him, but he knows what's best. He knows what needs to be done, what doesn't need to be done at the right times or the wrong times. It, so leave him in control, you know, because he knows what's best. And, and if we just let him teach us and I'll have the faith of, Everyone we've learned about so far, you know, and even more so than, you know, it'll be, it'll work out. Even if it is dark and gloomy, it'll work out. I think I see it in verse uh, 31, where he began to um, teach them about what he's going to have to suffer, suffer, (laughs) suffer, and how he's going to be rejected by the elders and everything. And it's like, you know. The apostles are with Jesus throughout his entire ministry. And so they saw his mir- they saw all of the good that he did, but they they also saw when the time came how dirty and how ugly things were going to get. But it's it's not like it just snuck up on them. You know, Jesus told them this is what's going to happen. This has to happen. You know, and then I mean all of that just kind of makes everything else fall into place. It's just like, listen, this has to happen. My plans can't be derailed because this is what I'm here for. And I'm going to provide you with everything that you need. But like you said, Dee, just know that it's going to get dark. It's going to get ugly. But I'm with you every step of the way. And you, you got to trust me. Um, so these things are going to they're going to happen. They're going to take place. But I'm going to be with you every step of the way. And. I don't know. I've said time and time again how I don't like to be left hanging. Like, if you want me to do something for you, like, give me every bit of instruction what it is that you want me to do. And time and time again, even when it does get ugly, Jesus never leaves the men hanging. He always lets them know what's going to happen, what's going to be. Um, So that's where I see it. So does that bring us to the end of this season? It does. Today's the last oh, episode. It's the last season. Today is the last episode. For our listeners, min- many of you may or may not know, but September of last year, I relocated to, well, not I, me and my family relocated to Bowling Green, Kentucky, and we, we took a workout here, and um, things have been going really good, and, and we're thankful for that. But... Mm, However, because 
because of the move and this the season of life that we're in this this new stage of our life this is going to be my last season and episode um no you're coming back as a guest yet well i'll be back as a guest (laughs) from time to time yes but i won't be you won't hear me on every on every single episode it'll be random episodes and i have um man i don't even know when did we start this Hmm. it's been over a year yeah it's been a year yeah Yeah, like it maybe one is so it's been over a year right yeah yeah so i i have truly enjoyed doing it and yeah it's very bittersweet i i don't want to leave but you know i kind of i it's it's what's best right now i kind of i kind of have to and so but um this isn't farewell this is more of just talk to you later um, but yeah, I hope that those who are listening will continue to listen because the podcast has done, has been great for me. It's been encouraging and getting to work with, with D and Stephanie and the both of them always, they always bring stuff that I never even think about. So I, I appreciate their nerding out. Their <laughs> out. <laughs> At least someone does. About it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't know half the stuff that I know. I mean, I'm telling y'all, the most intriguing thing to me was, do you know how long I thought the mustard seed was a mustard <laughs> plant? <laughs> I thought it was the green. I didn't realize it was a tree, and I'm still amazed at that. Like, I, how did I not know that? I have no clue. Yep. Just this is just a talk to you later. It's not a farewell. Lord willing, I, I will be able to come as a guest on on other episodes but i hope that you all will continue to listen um and be spiritually fed and nourished just as i have always been whenever i get to podcast with these ladies um so with that being said we want to thank you all for joining us today and for this um great season that we have had thus far um if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to contact us. We would love to study with you or connect you with someone local. Um, and as always, we hope you will seek to know the love of Christ in your own life. And until next time, bye. Bye. Bye, Brittany. You can reach out to us on Facebook or Instagram. We would love to hear from you. And be sure to click like and share this episode with family and friends. In doing so, you're sharing the love of Christ.